thanks for taking some time here. And uh, you know, we, we've we've asked this of everybody, but you're a you're a lifelong aquatics guy. How you been handling not being around a pool every day? You know, the interesting thing is where I live, um, <clears throat> I can actually see CDM pool. And so maybe like 10 days ago, they drained it to like halfway. And I was like, ah, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I can literally see it from my balcony. And so then the bright side of things was it got filled back up. So then I started thinking, okay, we're getting ready to get going again. And so, um, you know, I'm hopeful, you know, it's been hard being away from the water for this long, but um, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get getting back going here sooner rather than later. This is, this is what life has become. It's you scouting out pools in your neighborhood to check their depths. Exactly. At every <laughs> pool and all the little community pools that I used to jump in as well in the neighborhoods, you know, there's sun super lockdown. So um, haven't been in the water for five weeks, I guess, in total, which probably is the longest time in my life without touching water as far as like swimming laps or playing polo or body surfing, you name it. Cap7 has been sharing so much content uh, between yourself, Wolf, uh, putting out videos and just things you didn't even think you could do in your house. You know, I, I was joking with Wolf the other day that his family is training for some competition that none of us are ready for with with a level of fitness. But what's been the response that, that, that you guys at Cap7 have seen from some of these things you're sharing? You know, it's been a really positive response from the community. I think what everybody realizes is that, you know, we are a niche sport and we are very tightly knit. And so it's just been really cool to see everybody you know, kind of step up and share their material amongst colleagues. And then, and then the stuff that, you know, Wolf's been creating and um, doing in his little local neighborhood pool, which as you've noticed, the, the content in the water has dried up a little bit. Um, <laughs> we need night cameras. So when, when he pops in there <laughs> late night, uh, which we don't have night cameras, you know, so, um, you know, it's just been super positive. And I, I think people in general, um, are enjoying the content that everyone's creating. And I, I think one thing that's really important with this is all the club coaches and college coaches, anyone who's, you know, creating content to share with their clubs and, and athletes, they're all sharing it across platform. They're not holding it to themselves. And I think that, you know, environment where everyone is working together and just because we might be rival, we might have a rivalry with one another, we're not going to hold our content to ourselves. We're going to share it and we're going to help your coaches get better. Your athletes get better. So when we come back and play, you know, I think we'll be even a tighter community. Yeah, you're right. The, the collaboration has been unprecedented with everyone really just trying to share the best practices. And you've seen a lot of good videos, conversations, skills, drills, all that sort of stuff. Um, we've, we've talked all this week about, about leadership and about kind of development as a player and that sort of thing. And you, you bring an interesting perspective uh, in that, in your athletic days, not that you're not athletic, but in your, comp in your competition days, swimming and water polo, you did both at a very high level. Uh, people might know you now as, you know, a club coach or with Cap7, but if you think back to those days as a competitor, what, what was the benefit of, of doing both of those sports and, and maybe other sports that you were also doing as a younger kid? Yeah, I mean, I think my story differs from most is that um, I stayed competitive in all sports until – my freshman year in high school. So basketball, baseball, soccer, you name it, club soccer, all different kinds of things. And I'd probably to answer your question, the, the thing that probably, it kept me on the mental side, the most refreshed, because while everyone else was like really super focused and, you know, into their, you know, whatever ninth month of the season, I was coming in excited to get back to XYZ sports. So in high school specifically, I would go through my, you know, fall high school water polo season, and then I'd be excited to get in the swim season. And then I'd finish the swim season. And depending on what I was focusing on for that, that season, whether it be junior nationals for swimming or junior Olympics for water polo, my training would get modified. So I was always really relaxed and mentally refreshed because I was always doing something new and it wasn't a grind for me. And you, you give an experience that so many that got to a high level have given it. And I'm sure you've spoken to Olympians, not just in water polo and swimming and other sports. Sure, as water polo people, we'd love everyone to try and to play it. But the ones that get to the highest level, the Olympians often tell stories of trying so many different sports and then not until later in life realizing there was one or two things they were going to specialize in. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, what, what everyone has to remember is that 
to make it to the, the, the Olympics one, just to get to go is a huge opportunity, huge accomplishment, but to actually, you know, stand on the podium twice, which I've been lucky, fortunate to do is a lot of things have to fall in, in place for that to, to happen. And so I didn't have thoughts of being on an Olympic team when I was 15, 16, it really started to come about when I was in college. And so because I wasn't grinding so much um, and I was refreshed, I kept improving all the time, which kept me excited about both sports. Um, and so I think in the end, you know, becoming an Olympian, making the podium, and, and I often say this, is I, I, you know, it seemed really easy in, in 1996 when I did it. It was like, oh, you know, I'm going to keep doing this, get on the podium, you know, I'll, I'll walk out of here with, you know, six, eight gold medals and I'll be, <laughs> I'll be good, you know, after three Olympics. And I spent the next, you know, after 96, spent the next eight years of my life, you know, chasing that dream. But in chasing that dream, that was where I learned the most about myself because I had setbacks, I had injuries, I had, you know, things that didn't go so easy. It wasn't a walk in the park. And so I learned a ton about myself and had great experiences, met lots of great people. But in the end, you know, if, you know, there's some that say, okay, I knew when I was six, but most of my friends in the Olympic swimming team, Olympic water bowl team, you know, they started thinking about it later in life. We're talking with Brad Schumacher. Uh, multiple sport Olympian swimming and, and water polo for Team USA. A lot of the folks that watch these conversations, and last week our whole theme was about college, There, there's always a big emphasis on what to do to get into school for a sport, how to, how to perform well. From your standpoint, obviously University of the Pacific is where you uh, went to school and where you competed. But as you think back on juggling all these things, you're trying to be a student, you're trying to be a swimmer, a water polo player, were there certain things that you did that allowed you to be successful? Was it a frame of mind? Was it a certain routine? Was it someone that you uh, learned something from? Any any skills or pieces of wisdom you can share? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like anything. No, nobody achieves at a high level and wins gold medals and wins world championships and does that stuff without a you know an incredible support network. So it was the people around me, you know, starting with John Tanner, um, who's the Stanford women's coach. You know, he was my longtime coach throughout my entire career. And I think the biggest thing and the biggest, the, the team that we had put together that was supporting what we were doing in swimming and water polo at University Pacific from the cycle, you know, from the sports psychologist side to the weight trainers to nutrition and everything. We were looking at the whole picture and, and JT was kind of driving that bus. And in the end, you know, staying focused on what I could control was our, kind of our mantra and our theme. And so the, it, it really points to a situation like this is like, okay, right now we're in a completely new normal. And so I can control what I do every day and how I support my business and, and you know, the club team that I work with and just, you know, really taking the time to, you know, take a moment to, you know, write down what I'm going to accomplish during this period of time because this is going to end. And so those folks who, especially the, the, the student athletes that are out there now who are focused on improving during this time are going to have an advantage when we jump back in the pool. That's for sure. Yeah. And that's the, that's the challenge. Everyone I think is trying to, to stay regimented and stay in a routine so that they feel like they are ready. And we've talked with a number of uh, people that are kind of expert at this over the last couple of weeks, they've shared some great advice. So make sure you go to the USA water polo YouTube page to look at some of those conversations we're talking to Brad Schumacher here at a, at a certain point you had to pick right water polo or swimming to kind of devote more of your time to what was that process like and how difficult was it to just do one of those things more than the other you know that that really took place in 98 um, after world champs and you know I had an incredibly supportive water polo team um, that allowed me to like sit out of, out of games at world championships. And so I took a step back and I looked at the whole picture and I said to myself, okay, this is an individual goal for Brad Schumacher to make the Olympic team in swimming and water polo and compete at the highest level. But when I took a step back and I looked at the team that I was spending so much time with traveling around the world, getting prepared, the team that we won FINA cup with, I just, it wasn't fair for me to bring an individual goal and ask all of them to make sacrifices so that I could, you know, tick a box on something that I, I really wanted to do. And the other aspect of it was extremely difficult 
Um, I swam in the four by 100 freestyle relay at that world championships and I played water polo and I normally would rest for swimming for three weeks. So, I mean, the day before I sat out the day before um, we had a really important game and then they let me sit out a game prior to that. So I, I rested for two days instead of 23 days. And so it really was driven by, you know, my, my really caring about the team in itself and wanting to commit myself to a new challenge and seeing how, you know, how difficult is it to get 13 guys to play at the highest level at the Olympic games. And I can tell you, it's really, really hard. <laughs> Brad, a, a swimming gold medalist in 1996, water polo men's national team, as you just alluded to, ramping up to 2000, right? You had this dream of doing both. And then eventually you dropped the swimming, you do water polo in 2000 in Sydney. And then after that, uh, right, you kind of you kind of continue on, and then you were trying to circle back to swimming for 04? Yeah, so after, you know, playing on the team, and then, you know, I was in the process of finishing my MBA and kind of thinking about the future and where I wanted to go next, I decided it was time to, you know, to, to take a break. And then I happened to be at back at UOP getting my MBA, and um, I was actually commuting back and forth from Southern California, and there was a new coach that came into town and he's like, Hey, why don't you just jump in a couple times a week, swim with me, you know, like, you know, I'll train you a little bit. Let's see, see where you are. And I was like, ah, yeah, I'm kind of done. You know, I'm 30 years old, 31. And so of course he kept at me and convinced me to jump in the pools. The guy's name is Tim Teeter. And, uh, and then of course he convinced me to go to a master's meet out at, uh, in Arizona. I went to that meet and I swam right on my best times that I had swim in college. Wow. Um, and I was like, I'm back. <laughs> and I'm, I'm back I can do it and then immediately immediately I you know I said oh I got to move to a, a team with professionals and so then I moved back down south moved away from him you know like two months later and then I, I went in trained with Nova um, with a, a big group of professionals there was like 20 of us um, which was a, a great experience and um, but a likely not the wisest decision to to move away from that that young coach who was really had me like pegged with how I needed to train. So didn't end up making the team in 2004, made it to trials, um, had an injury or, or whatever, but it was, that was probably the most challenging part of my sporting career was I, it wasn't easy anymore. I was having time, people that I used to, you know, really dominate in the pool and swimming, I was now chasing. And it was, it was really every day I woke up, I wanted to quit. And that's probably the biggest lesson that I learned. It, when it wasn't going well, I kind of pointed to like when a pitcher gets in a slump is every day I went back to training. I, you know, stayed with it and I, you know, kept after it. And, you know, I met some new great young athletes along the way. I was able to mentor them in, in the process and made some great friends for life. But ultimately I didn't, you know, reach the team and I didn't make, make it back to the Olympics. But there were so many lessons for me personally in that, in that journey. We'll, we'll get to a couple of questions here. We're talking with Brad Schumacher, uh, cap set and water polo club, club water polo coach with set, of course, Olympian for USA swimming and USA water polo. Our, our theme this week has been leadership. And you had mentioned 97, 98, you're in this position where you have a very supportive water polo team that's allowing you to try and swim and play water polo at the same time. What, what sort of, you know, and, and, and without having a label of captain or leading scorer, how do you think you carried yourself that you kind of generated the respect that people allowed you to do both, right? Because not, not every person could pursue that without being perceived as that guy's in it for himself or he's not dedicated to this or that. But it sounds like you're able to kind of walk that line until, until you made a choice on your own that it didn't feel right. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot, you know, goes, goes out to, you know, coach John Vargas, who was, you know, the, the national team coach, Olympic team coach. And, and that staff and how they were kind of molding the team. And in 97, when we won FINA Cup, um, kind of out of nowhere, um, we went into that tournament and they had really put us in a position that we were really, the, the one thing I remember perfectly now is, and, and always is at our trainings at the end of, end of every weekend, because we were always doing weekend trainings, come in Friday, train all, you know, five, six workouts all in a row you know, throughout the weekend, and then everybody would disperse back to wherever they were going. And they made it really competitive and team-driven, so they would just select two, two guys on the team, and you'd pick teams. 
So then you could really see, you know, who people really wanted to play with on each side. If, you know, one guy picked this guy, he'd pick the other. And those, you know, scrimmages at the end, which, you know, the typical game, were really, really competitive. And that's really what it got us to the point where we were, you know, kind of molded into this, like, strong unit as a team. And, you know, even when Shai Cradell got injured in one of the uh, scrimmages with Russia, got punched in the face and broke his, broke his uh, orb, um, you know, so we were down a guy and we were able to, to roll through that tournament just because it was a really strong unit. Um, I think that, you know, hats off, hats off to the to the coaches. And I think, you know, over time, and then, then I, I, I think to where we were at the Olympics, you know, things changed within the team. And so, you know, it didn't end up working out for us. We ended up in sixth place. But, um, you know, they, you learn a lot in retrospect. I think everyone plays armchair quarterback after the fact. Yeah. And, you know, it's like anything, you know, you get prepared and then it's a game. And sometimes things don't bounce your way. Sometimes the draw doesn't bounce your way. But in the end, you know, I, I, it's just another water polo tournament, you know. But at the time, I didn't think of it like that. It's just another water polo. It's like, oh, I'm at the Olympic Games. It's such a big deal. So if I give any of our, like, especially our guys advice now mm -hmm. on the men's team specifically is, you know, I, I, I go to all their stuff because, you know, we're – in the international ball business. And so I'm at everything, world champs, all the, the big major events, because we're eventually going to be the, you know, the official ball of FINA. That's, that's the goal of the company. And so we will be there. Um, and, you know, hopefully for 2024 and, you know, you know, we've actually put a bid in, we're, we're in the process, but um, they're, I mean, they're really developing such a great team atmosphere and chemistry. And they are, it is, such a wide open Olympics when it comes to you start thinking about the players who have retired, the age of some of the players of the strongest teams over time. Now it's delayed another year. We get another year to train. I mean, our guys can medal. Like yeah. they, they really can. It's just like, you know, Australia pulled their, their funding on the men's team because they didn't get a result at a world championships. I believe they got fifth or sixth place and they were supposed to, to, you know, be in the top four. I mean, that's why we stepped in as a company to, to help support them, you know, with our partners down in Australia. We, we did that because they are right there. They're a very good team as well. And they're just like us. So I think there's seven or eight teams that can medal, you know, like that really have a chance. And it just, you know, just the guys have to believe in that 100%. Because I, I do, you know, it's, it's something that can happen. Well, and, and we saw it before, right, 2008, that was a team that nobody was picking to reach the podium. They came in ninth in, in, into Beijing after a lot of tough but close losses, and they end up beating some of the best teams in the world. So uh, it is it is certainly possible, and hopefully the extra year pays off. Yeah, for um, sure. I mean, you, you think about 2008 specifically. The way I, the way I look at the Olympics is, like, you got to have a few things bounce your, your way. Your goalie has to get super hot. Merrill mm -hmm. got hot, and it, people – started freaking out about shooting on him and that was yeah. a fact and then the team came together and you had ryan bailey you know arguably the the one of the best centers of our in our country of all time and he you know played his best water polo at the most important moment and so and then everybody's supporting around him it was you know it was really fun to watch that, that was the one olympic i did not go to um to beijing i've been to the you know london and rio and was planning to go to Tokyo and I'll, I'll go to Tokyo as well. But in the end, yeah, that's the, I mean, that's where I feel like our, our men's team is. And obviously we can't not talk about the girls. The girls team is just what they're doing and what they're accomplishing and the consistent, you know, just excellence on all levels and, and them not getting complacent because they are the best team in the world. It's just really impressive to watch. And what, what Adam Krikorian is, is doing and continues to do to challenge that group is is really you know it's it's for the you know the history books you know and I think you know I'm obviously very impressed with him but the girls in general uh the women's team sorry not girls women's team you know the it's not easy being in a in a situation where you have lots of people with a couple gold medals or everyone has one and you know everyone has you know some sort of agent or representative that's not easy to manage, and the way he's managing it, I'm just I'm really impressed by it. Yeah, they, they're at a level now where they win so often and are so dominant that people forget 
the and this 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 just happens with any dominant team, but you forget the work that has to go in every day to make things look that simple. Oh yeah, I mean, there, <laughs> it seems really really easy, but it you yeah. know I I can tell you being on the you know the Olympic swimming team where everyone has an agent, everyone has representation, everyone has their own personal coach, everyone has their own set of rules they want to they want to work in. It's not easy. That's the hardest thing. And then to get them to to play together at that level consistently. I mean, it's just, it's, it's awesome to see. And, you know, I'm excited for them and the opportunities that they get to actually, you know, compete in this Olympics, you know, because there were, there were, you know, they were talking and like, Hey, well, what if they don't have the Olympics, you know, which would just be, you know, a travesty on many, many levels. And I don't think that's even a question anymore. We're going to Tokyo next summer. That's the, that's the plan. We're talking to Brad Schumacher here. Some really good questions starting to come in as, we, as we've talked here. G going back to that time when you were doing both swimming and water polo, Jason asks, how, how did you train for both? What was a typical week or typical month like for you as far as the schedule goes? Yeah, so the, the typical schedule, and I'll just use like when I was in, when I was in college. And so um, if, if I was in water polo season, then I was focused on water polo and I would do the water polo trainings like all the other guys. But then in the end of workouts, you know, we always finished with 10 sprints all out. And, it, you know, one of my goals, I had to win all of those sprints, every single training, all the time. Um, and there were some really fast guys on the team who were, you know, equally as fast as I was. So that was one way I kept sharp with, like, from a racing perspective. And then as we got towards the end of the season, you know, I was lifting weights three to four times a week, you know, hitting the trainers and stretching and doing all, all the – that side of the, the training. And then towards the end of, after following NC2As, I would just spend a week in the, in the pool, just focused on technique because I was already fit. I wasn't mm -hmm. not fit. I, I was more fit after polo season for swim season because I wasn't just chasing the black line. I was chasing yeah. the, the guys on the team. I was chasing the ball. So you just, you, you're able to push yourself a little further, I feel like. And so then I would make my NC2A cuts right in December at the Speedo Cup. And then I had a huge advantage over a lot of, you know, the other college swimmers because they were just kind of picking up their season. You know, they had been doing, you know, their off season, you know, lighter training, and then they were ramping for their conference meet. And I didn't have to ramp for my conference meet because, I mean, it was the water polo team was the swim team. So yeah. I would just swim through that and I wouldn't rest. So I could, I could do a full taper for NC2As and focus on that. And so I was able to go in and have some really good results at NC2As, which, I mean, it, it was it was fun, but it was also um, challenging because I would be one guy and there would be teams of like SC, Stanford. And, you know, fortunately, you know, I made some JTs obviously connected with Stanford since he went there. So I used to hang with those guys and, you know, sit in their kind of team area and they kind of adopted me for lack of a, a better <laughs> word so i at least had someone to kind of to chat with and hang out with like during the meet because there's a lot of downtime that's yeah for sure so. and to try and balance both of those and uh the tapering and everything and it seemed like it well it doesn't seem like it certainly worked out to your to your advantage we go now to a question from laura what what is your advice to a high school athlete who's getting pressure from a coach to pick water polo or swimming yeah, I mean, I think that the most important thing there is to understand what what's going to take you to your next level. What's your next? Are, are you going to? Do you think you're going to play college water polo, um, or do you think you're going to be a college swimmer? You know, which direction are you going to go? Um, it's just it's really really difficult now to to do both. Um, but once you know that direction, then it should be like anything. The, the main focus, if it were water polo, that should take, during water polo season, that should take precedent. And then it's all about communication with the coaches. Because what, you know, from, from my experience, and I would, you know, talk to coaches and, hey, you know, a good, you know, Bill Rose, famous Michigan B.O. Natador coach. And I used to train with him when I'd come down south when I wasn't living here. And I'd say Coach Rose, because, I mean, he was the hardest coach in the world, like so hard. I said, Coach Rose, what, what, there's this empty pool over here, the diving well at Marguerite. I was like, why don't you throw some water polo kids over there? And he was like, Brad, how can I, you know, throw water polo kids over there? They'll be throwing a ball, laughing, having a great time. And I'm trying to tell these kids to do 10 500s. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, maybe you shouldn't do so many 10 500s and yeah. make it, 
<laughs> make it a little less, you know, monotonous for lack of a better word. But I think that's, it's really the coaches are, you know, they're trying to help you to do your best. But I think that sometimes I was really fortunate always because my coaches, when I always was at, I was at the Naval Academy club, um, Navy juniors. And so we had a swimming program and a water polo program. So the two coaches would talk. So I never had to worry about it. They just created the schedule and said, Hey, Brett, today you're going to Lejeune for swimming. Tomorrow you're going to McDonough for water polo. And if I missed one or the other, I, I never could like skip a swimming workout and go to water polo. I couldn't skip a water polo and go to swim. So they were handling that for me. But I think it's all about communication. And I would tell the kids, you know, have the hard conversations with the coach and let them know what, what you're trying to accomplish. And I think most coaches are starting to really see that mental break and that benefit and how the kids will actually perform better doing less. And especially now with how training has changed on the swimming side, it's much more segmented, sprint oriented, you know, and you can just do a lot less than what they used to think you had to do. Seven, 8,000 meters a day is no longer the norm. A uh, couple of questions here from AB, and you kind of just covered the one about, about the pressures to pick one sport or the other. You weren't, you weren't really forced into that as kind of a high school kid and playing club, but, but uh, the second part to that, do, do you regret not focusing on just one, just trying to go to three Olympics in swimming or just three in water polo? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, you know, that, I, I bounce that around often is because, you know, I, I swam in 96 in the Olympics and then um, I didn't swim my senior year of college because I moved on to be a professional. Um, I had some opportunities, like professional opportunities with companies and so on and so forth. So I often think, you know, because I never ended up getting to swim arrested NC2As after I had done so much training long course. So I think I would have swam a lot faster. So sometimes it creeps in my mind, like, gosh, I wonder if I would have just kept swimming when I still swam through 2004 or even 2008, potentially. And, you know, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that because, you know, I can't change it at this point. But, yeah, it creeps into my mind. But it's a really good question. I mean, you think about if I would put all my energy into just myself and focused on that, you know, like where I could have taken it. But at that point in time, my, my, my mind was with, with water polo. I was just, I was fascinated by the game. I was fascinated by the, the international travel and going to different places and, you know, playing in front of 5,000 people in Italy where, you know, they're lighting, you know, you know, things off in the stands and they're, you know, <laughs> going bananas. I, I just, I really enjoyed that part of it. Yeah, the the average person today, of course, in the water polo world, only only probably thinks of you as a water polo guy, as a water polo Olympian. Do you do you kind of still see yourself as both? Are you are you both a swimmer and a, and a water polo player? If you think of yourself, yeah, for sure. I mean, if I, if if I were to, you know, when I go back to the pool now, I, I swim more now than I play water polo. Sure. You know, like just because it's I can do it on my own and I can jump in for a half an hour workout and get it done. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like. I always looked at it as both sports. I mean, it's kind of interesting that I ended up with a water polo company, yeah. you know, and building a brand in the water polo space when I, you know, won my gold medals in swimming. Um, but I mean, it's, it's proven to be super valuable um, having crossed over both worlds with USA swimming and, and their level of, um, you know, involvement and their, their power and in the international level. Um, it's definitely helped me, you know, get meetings that I otherwise probably wouldn't have gotten because I was an Olympian and had gold medals. And, you know, I was able to, you know, get a meeting with Dr. Maglioni in, in Uruguay. You know, it's not an easy thing to do, but that's, you know, it's, it's part of my pedigree and, you know, I'm, I'm a, I have the opportunity to do that. So it's been, it's been really valuable for sure. We're talking with Brad Schumacher here from, from cap seven Olympian in water polo and in swimming. You touched on the Annapolis Club, and so it's worth mentioning. You know, I feel like we're 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 providing some historic facts here, talking about your '96 Olympic gold medals, but also Brad, part of this special club team to win the Junior Olympics, and and the and the last team to do it to win the what what would be the equivalent now to 18 and under platinum was what your Annapolis Club won uh, back in '90 or '91. It was. At, at the time, did you have any sense of how big of a deal it was? And did you think it would still hold up today? 
You know, I, at, at the time, we had no idea. We were just a group of guys from the East Coast who were really competitive. And again, we had great leadership. We had, we had Mike Schofield and Dan Sheridan were kind of leading our team and, and Milan, Milan as well. I don't want to say his last name because I'll, I'll butcher it. It's to, <laughs> to it's to answer it. I, you know, I always butchered his name. But, you know, we had a really great, you know, they were great leaders for us. And they were young guys who, you know, put this group of kids together. And we were just having a lot of fun. But, you know, I would have never thought that we would be the, like the only team. I don't know if anyone else has meddled from outside since then, but, um, you know, I, I thought, you know, you know, as we've seen the sports grown, it's getting more professional, it's growing up. And so I think it will happen again here in the near future. Um, you know, I think in general, you know, everything's improved over the last, you know, 25, 26 years for sure. So we're, 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 we're improving all the time. The sports maturing, you know, and the, the marketplace is maturing for sure. You see that with the number of, you know, professional coaches that sure. we have in our sport now. Just a few more questions here uh, for, for Brad. When you were coming up, was there, if you think back, who, who was, or maybe there's more than one, who was the water polo player that you, you kind of looked at as like the example that like you, you were a big fan of? And then same for who was the swimmer that you really admired and looked up to? Yeah, so on the on the water polo side, I mean, you know, I was a part of the era when the you know the the eighty four team when they were you know promoted, you know, I mean they were everywhere, and you know I don't know anybody who was in my vintage who didn't have the poster of the team and the sunglasses and the sandals <laughs> on their wall in their house. So I actually got a pretty funny story is the guy that I I was like looking at as like the the guy who I thought you know was the the best player at the time it was Terry Schroeder. And I can remember the day at UC San Diego when we were out there training and I had got to play a game against him when I was still in high school. And I remember to this day because he had the ball in his hand, you know, like up, like, and his bicep was like that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to take the ball from Terry Schroeder. And I leaped up and I grabbed his bicep like this. And it didn't move at all. And I'm like, like literally <laughs> putting all my weight on it. And the ball didn't even move. And he just kind of looked at me and shrugged his arm and, and would just you know, kept on going. It was like I wasn't even there. But, you know, I was probably 155 pounds soaking wet. And But that was a great story with him. Um, and, you know, that's someone who I, I you know, I, I looked up to and thought was just, you know, an amazing player. Um, on the swimming side, you know, I really, I really looked up to Matt Biondi. Cause, cause he had, um, you know, played some water polo on a different level, but he had swum on a, on an individual level that was at the highest level. And I actually was fortunate. Um, you know, he, I, I got to know him and I would go to, you know, Hawaii a lot for training. And so got to spend some time with him and, and get to know him personally. And, you know, just an amazing athlete all around and has turned, um, you know, it's just that for me, he was like a guy's like, okay, He's kind of like what I'm trying to do. Um, and he's, you know, swimming at the highest level and doing individual. And I'm playing water polo, at, you know, I guess I'll say at a higher level than he was. And then, you know, so th those were the two guys. You, you two are examples of, of, of those crossovers, but typically people kind of stay, stay in their own sport for the most part. But it comes up so often, usually around the Olympics, people will look at super fast swimmers, you know, a Michael Phelps or a Katie Ledecky and say, I'll be, it'd be cool to have them in water polo. You know, I wonder what they would do in water polo. Uh, you know, obviously opening sprints would be an advantage. Having been in so, so involved in swimming, you know, would, would that be an easy transition? I mean, obviously they bring speed, but I imagine there's just no uh, practice with the physicality of the game when you're just swimming back and forth to prepare for races and swimming. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, it would obviously, you know, somebody as gifted as like a Michael Phelps or a Katie Ledecky, but I mean, you got to take into consideration the the ball skills and the the physical nature of it, um, because you can imagine like having that speed is great, but then you've got to wrestle with the two hundred and twenty five yeah. pound <laughs> Serbian, and yeah. you know, be able to you know hold your own, you know, in that. So 
I mean, I think some, there's some guys that could really would have excelled in our sport on the, on the Olympic team. I've got a funny story. When I was at world champs and the, and the, the preparation and go to a, a training camp, I had to go to the swimming training camp. They wouldn't let me out of it. So I had to train with them. And so, you know, coach Barker said, yeah, go, go to that training camp, just take a ball with you. And so I would take a ball. And so I do my swimming stuff, which was next to nothing because I was tapering. And then I would take the ball and I'd throw it off the, find the wall and, you know, do, do different skill work that they gave me. And what, at the end of practice, I had like Gary Hall, Josh, Josh, uh, Josh Davis, John Olson, you name it, like all the, like the, the best swimmers in the world. And they're like, Hey Brad, let's pass. And the coaches had kind of like let us be because we were doing our, our kind of warm down stuff. And so next thing you know, they're like, we're all the like 10 guys are like <laughs> whipping the ball around. They're having the greatest time in the world. And the coaches literally start running down the deck and they're like, what the heck is going on? What are you guys <laughs> doing? You're in training. We're about to go world championships. How can you do this? And, and then they said, so and they, they, they made me stop. And then they pulled me aside and like, Hey, your, your training time has now changed. You can't bring the ball <laughs> to, to practice. So, I don't know. I, I I think times have changed a lot and people, people see the value in that mental break to play some water polo and still stay fit because they're really complimentary. Right. So I don't know. That, I thought that was, that was always a funny story to me. How they thought it was going to ruin their, their, their swimming. Oh my God, they touched the ball. They're going to ruin their swimming. So uh, really a question here from April and, and you can probably speak to this as, you know, as someone who has coached uh, age group water polo, but, but uh, they ask, do you recommend younger kids, 12U, 14U, to do both swim team and water polo? How many times a week should they be swimming, just trying to prevent burnout and injury and that sort of thing? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I like the, the three on, you know, like the three-two combo. So if you're playing water polo three times a week and then supplementing with swimming two times a week, because you're going to get some natural swimming done during your water polo training with counterattack or whatever that may be. Um, so I, I think that's a good amount and it varies by athlete and, and, and by the maturity as well, you know, of that particular athlete, you know, and, and what they can handle, you know, it's like some 12 year old kids can handle going five, six, seven times a week. Some can't, some can handle three. So it's just having that balance, but I think having some focused swimming time where you're getting some work done, but it doesn't have to be really long. It can be shorter and more focused. And so that way you're getting that, you know, high level energy systems that you're working on so that you're developing your, you know, the, the vertical to horizontal. The one thing with, with swimming and is what, you know, I tell all my coaches, if you want to get somebody in shape, don't swim freestyle. Everybody can swim free. You got to swim IM, fly back, breast free. It's like, that'll get you, like when we were getting, you know, back in shape, we always swam IMs because it's hard. And it's more difficult. All the, you know, when everyone's saying, oh, we got to do 2200 meters, no, just swim 10, 100 IMs every single day. You'll be back in shape in a couple of weeks and no time at all. Brad, really good stuff here. Before that, you go, uh, any, anything in the world of Cap 7 we should know about? It? Anything, uh, I mean, obviously there's no uh, competitions right now, but stuff you're excited about down the road when we, when we get back to live water polo? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like anything. We're, you know, we're operating as normal. You know, we're, we have our full staff and, you know, our, our team is great and, you know, they continue to develop, you know, new ideas and, you know, we're working on a lots of designs for, for teams and they're getting ready. So when, when we do open up, because the, the bottom line is we're going to open up, you know, and then just, you know, getting ready for and making sure that when this rush comes back, that we can fulfill the demand, you know, it's like with rebounders, you know, we sold, you know, three months of inventory in two weeks. Really? You know, wow. So, yeah, yeah so we're, we're working with our partners all across the globe to, um, you know, restock up, make sure we have all the, the gear merchants. For, fortunately, we, we make and hold in a lot of places in the world. And so we were able to pull down off of, you know, some of our inventory that doesn't sit in the United States. But, you know, we're excited for everyone to get back and to compete and play. Um, and I, I know everybody misses it. We know that. We all do. And I think you know, this is a little, you know, not a little, a very big wake-up call that, you know, yeah. water polo is in our blood and we're going to want to be back and playing and having fun with our friends, for sure. Excellent. Well, Brad Schumacher, uh, Olympian, swimmer, water polo player, club coach, Cap7. Uh, you're wearing a hat right now, but you, but you wear a lot more of them too. So uh, thanks, thanks so much for the time and all the advice and information. Really appreciate it.
Yeah, hey, Greg, on your side, keep up doing what you're doing. I mean, all this information that's flown out to all these kids, it's just, you know, there's lots of clubs that, you know, are, are in a difficult time. They might not have the resources to do these things. So hats off to you. Appreciate all you guys are doing at USA Water Polo. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. And we'll, and we'll keep it going. More, more at home 